Few topics are more important today than burnout, both for us and those we lead. How can we understand it better so we can avoid it and overcome it? Today's episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast was recorded during our virtual LeaderCon event. You can learn more at virtualleadercon.com. And now on with today's episode. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is brought to you by Kevin's Daily Newsletter. The Daily Newsletter is a short email delivered Monday through Friday, written to inspire, engage, and focus you on becoming the best person and leader you can be. Learn more and sign up at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash daily. And now here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Wow, we have a change. The world has changed. Most of you thought we were going to be. Uh, and and now, Marissa, I think you can maybe connect this thing back to the LinkedIn event. I hope. I think. I'll see if you can use your magic to figure that part out. But we're at least here. And I think people are going to be joining us from both YouTube and LinkedIn because we had a problem with our other technology. Uh, and so Jennifer, we've been at this all week. We've had like zero problems uh, until right now. Yes. Um, so welcome those of you that are here and welcome those of you that might join us later. I'm here with Jennifer Moss. And what we're doing is doing the next session in virtual LeaderCon, excuse me. And we're also hopefully creating a, an episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast with Jennifer Moss as my guest. She's the author of this marvelous book. We're going to talk about that in a second, but first let me introduce her to you. Jennifer Moss is an award-winning journalist, international public speaker, and the author of The Burnout Epidemic, The Rise of Chronic Stress, and How We Can Fix It. And guess what? It comes out next Tuesday. So excited. How awesome is that? She's a nationally syndicated radio columnist reporting on topics related to happiness and workplace well-being. She's also a freelance writer. Her, she has articles in the Huffington Post, Forbes, and Sherm, Fortune, HBR. Her previous book, Unlocking Happiness at Work, received the Distinguished UK Business Book of the Year Award. She sits on the Get This Global Happiness Council uh, to acknowledge her contributions to business and public service. Moss was named a Canadian Innovator of the Year, an International Female Entrepreneur of the Year, and recipient of the Public Service Award from the Office of President Obama. So I count three countries there that have awarded you in one way or the other. It's pretty awesome. And, <laughs> Thank and, you. and, and while it won't make a list, now you're a guest on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast and Virtual Leader Comp. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so happy to be here. It's going to be great. I loved our discussion earlier, so I'm glad that we're able to extend it. Me too. So, all right. I'm just going to dive right in. This isn't going to be as pretty as they normally are when I'm on LinkedIn with low, lower thirds and all that stuff. But yeah. all of you, I can see your comments. Here's the question. Why is this an epidemic? It's an epidemic because it's been a problem across the globe for decades, probably longer. You know, I joke in the book, um, maybe not a joke, but really that, you know, it started with the pyramids. You know, the fact that the royalty lived about three times as long because they didn't have to do any of the work. I mean, we really have been seeing this rise of overwork and it's been impactful. And it was in 2019 pre pandemic that the World Health Organization actually identified it as a workplace phenomena and that it, it was worthy enough of including in their IDC 11, their international classification of diseases because people were dying from overwork. So I think you know, it, there's catastrophic effects. We've sort of been downplaying it for a long time, but now we see it in every part of the world impacting people. And particularly now that we've gone through this pandemic. Okay. So you, you just said uh, that I said, why is there a burnout epidemic? And you're talking about overwork, but there's more to this than just work, right? There's more reasons that we have it. There's more causes, right? Before we can talk about fixing it, we got to, we got to recognize that it exists. You just told us that. Yeah. I mean, it's classified as a disease, everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't realize it was serious, it's serious. So then we've got to think about what are the causes, right? 
So that's the question. What are the causes uh, of it? Well, you know, and I have to backtrack because the international classification of diseases didn't go so far to say that it's actually a disease, but that it's a syndrome. And so I want to just put that there because it should be. In Sweden, it's considered something that is treatable. It's a mental illness, but it's the only country in the world, of course, it's in Sweden, that they would identify that. But, you know, we have a lot of causes that are, are, you know, impacting it from systemic discrimination to lack of fairness to lack of agency, being micro managed we saw that a lot this year i mean there's yeah these- let's slow down slow down because there are people are taking notes first of all but second of all in the book you really talk about six major causes and you started yes. rolling through those but let's let's sort of sort of bullet them out a little bit more and then we can maybe unpack a, a couple of them okay so six major areas of cause you started to, to, to lay them out but i think people mm-hmm. are going to want to really have a chance to think about them and, and really here's what i want you to do everybody while you're listening and you don't have to answer in the chat, uh, you know, your answer. But I want you to think about the six causes. And I want you to think about which ones are mine, which are the ones that are impacting me, right? That's what I want you to think about as Jennifer is sort of unpacking this for us. So with that, what are the, what are the six causes for now? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm glad that we're spending some time uh, addressing them uh, one by one, because it's um, important to understand that burnout is not something that can be solved with self-care alone. You know, it's good to optimize and to care about ourselves. It's also part of the solution. But when you look at the root causes, the six of them, they're pretty macro and they're systemic issues like workload and cultures of overwork are sort of legacy inside of lots of organizations like tech and finance and healthcare and, and teaching. And so we see that almost like it pulls people in that have these high performing mindsets and then they overwork. Um, we're seeing this too in certain roles uh, and industries in China and Japan. There's actually a term for death by overwork in Japan called Karoshi. So it's a it's a stem- systemic problem that's causing a lot of issues. And that's just happening now where we're working in the pandemic about 30% more per day. We have 24% more meetings in North America. We're looking at working about two to four more hours a day. So- I'm laughing. I'm not laughing because that's because that's funny. But I, I the number of times I've had clients say I, I've never been in more meetings. I didn't think it was possible to be in more meetings and now in more meetings than ever before. So I think that you said, what did you say, 20 or 24 percent? That might be low. Right. <laughs> At least in terms of in all seriousness. Yes. And and the good news is for those who are of you who have been in virtual leader con all week, um, virtualleadercon.com, you can still join us if you're with us live here. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that do we need that meeting uh, or how could we, well, how else can we get to that outcome without a meeting and a, and a bunch of stuff related to that, which can start to, start to help with this workload scenario? Go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that plays a big role in us being able to mitigate issues uh, of workload is just reducing that amount of meeting fatigue, which was a problem before. I mean, we had way too many meetings before. It was a huge issue and we wasted a ton of money and time on meetings. And now we're just doing it you know, exponentially more and all virtually, which is exhausting. But workload is one and is the leading cause. And, you know, that's why we tackle it the most because it is a leading cause. It was pre-pandemic. It is now in the pandemic and probably will be forever. Um, just because of that legacy that we have, that working really hard and so many hours means you're more productive, which is not true. You know, so we have that, you have you know, lack of agency, which is essentially not having choice where, how, when you hit your goals, feeling like every single effort that you make or action you take at work is being measured or monitored. You know, we're seeing the increase of boss wear, you know, that where people are starting to watch, you know, you while you're working, that's just exponentially risen. And that lack of- Surely now that's starting to go back. I know what had happened when we first went into the pandemic. Like, I know that that happened. I- uh, surely people have fi- figured out the air of those ways, but perhaps not. No, the amount of boss wear that has come into um, people's or monitor wear, the people that has, co- that has come into people's workplaces has dramatically increased. I mean, there's just so much more of it on the market and so much more usage of it to monitor what people are doing. And that's just so wrong. I don't understand how we think that that's appropriate, but that leads to lack of agency. And when we don't have any choice 
And especially if we're in a marginalized group that in society, we feel like we don't have a lot of choice. We feel like we're highly controlled in our choices because of systemic discrimination and those other things going on in in the macro society. Then when we go into work and then we feel like we have no choice there, it it predicts, you know, that risk of burnout. And we also see. So we're two in, right? That's two. But there's a question that came in that's connected to the first two. Um, workload, the, yeah. La- the lack question of is, how do we shut it off? And and the question might have come in when we were still talking about the workload, but I think it actually relates a lot to the second one, which is you have the control, perhaps, to turn it off. And so, but but Daniel's question is, how do you recommend shutting time, shutting off time for yourself? It's it's challenging for people that are high performing, and if they're in a culture of overwork and they feel like that's not a place that they can take that space. But it's it's consequential. Right now we're in 20 months in and we are working like we're still in an emergency and emergency by definition is is unexpected. This isn't unexpected anymore. This is endemic. And so we have to start thinking sustainably about how we're going to survive and compete and be productive and engaged in our jobs, you know, from now until we we retire. And we're not going to do that unless we're able to take that space the leaders in particular need to model the behavior because we all see this, we all hear about this in other areas of business, but employees can't be what they can't see. So we need to be really good at modeling and we need to be taking time away from our digital devices. We shouldn't be answering emails on you know, our vacation. We should be taking vacations as leaders. We need to have boundaries. It's no longer work-life balance. It's like work-life boundaries. And I think we need to be thinking more about how do we instill these spaces of time that are protected because we are going to create an obsolete workforce because there's no way that we can sustain this pressure and this uh, dealing with such a massive crisis, this macro stressor, while we have all these micro stressors happening at work. So they have to, we need to focus on that as a priority. William says seven, seven rule, no emails after 7 PM before 7 AM. Um, so there's there's an example of what that might look like. And you made the huge point about the role of the leader in it, because I, as a leader, if I send an email to someone at 710, then uh, they might look at it. And I didn't, maybe I didn't want them to, but it doesn't matter. Um, exactly. Right? It doesn't matter. They watch, my, they watch my fingers and my feet more than my lips, Jennifer. I'm just saying. All right. Workload is a cause. Perceived lack of control or agency is a cause. What's cause yes. number three? And then there's um, lack of community. So loneliness, you know, people feeling like they're isolated and lonely in the data that we gathered this year. I did have the privilege of working with Dr. Maslach and Dr. Michael Leiter, who are the foremost experts in burnout. And we surveyed people across 46 different countries. We asked a couple open-ended questions. We got a lot of qualitative feedback um, back to us, which was excellent because it really described in their words, how people were feeling. A lot of people felt like they if especially our younger workforce started work inside the pandemic, had no relationships, you know, fundamental sort of foundational relationships with their team. So they felt like they used words like my career is being held back. I don't feel connected to anyone. You know, those are the types of issues that they're dealing with because we have moved further into single occupancy dwellings just by, you know, just over the last 20 years anyways, there's less multi-generational families together. And when we looked at that data, the people living alone without kids were the ones that were actually the most unwell, the sickest, the most burnt out. And so when you have that and you don't have relationships at work because we're in this, you know, socially isolated environment, it's really impacted the workforce. And there's a lot of people burning out, especially our younger workforce who feels like that they have to take on the extra load for their, you know, sort of struggling, juggling parents um, that are on the team. And yes, parents are really impacted, but we're not seeing the loneliness pieces being a high risk of burnout as well as workload. You know, the thing that I've been saying for a long time is we had an epidemic of loneliness before we had a pandemic of the COVID. And and obviously we had a we had an epidemic of burnout before this. And it, and and both the loneliness one and the burnout one have both grown. Right. They have. They have. I mean, this crisis just exacerbated all those existing problems, but really blew up the loneliness piece because of the way that we had to work. 
the, the isolation, even just people being in the office, describe it being different in that, you know, there's, there's a difference in shaking hands. And sometimes you have to be on at different times than other people because it's been, you know, it's the way that it's been set up for safety. We want safety to be number one, but we're, we have to integrate mental health supports as well to understand that that's hard for a lot of people, especially people that get fueled by others that like to be around each other. Um, they're really feeling disconnected right now. Yeah, that is so true. Uh, there's a comment that, that came in uh, in this particular case, I believe it was on YouTube. It says, I have a call and I'm going to make a comment and then you can add to it if you want. I have a colleague who signs emails with, I'm quote, I'm sending this email at a time convenient for me. Please respond at a time convenient for you for your work day. That's great as far as it goes, unless you're the boss. If you're the boss, it doesn't matter. You've got to learn that you have a button that says delay, delay delivery. And yes. you better be delaying it because it doesn't, you can say that and it's certainly better than not. And as a peer, perhaps that's fine, but we still don't know how that's landing. Like I love, love, love the sentiment, but I don't know that it's going to solve, solve, solve the problem. I think Kevin, you nailed it on the head. It's, it's these ways of behaving that, you know, are, are sort of filled with privilege. And I don't want to say that that's, you know, that's in this case, that's your coworker or colleague's situation. It's just, when we are the boss or when we, you know, we're in a place where we don't have to worry about that as much, we don't know how it's landing with other people. It's kind of like, you know, we're giving a week off to our burned out employees. Well, you're missing the point. They're burned out and you're giving them a week off, but it's because you burn them out. So what do you think is going to change when they go back? They're not going to go back to an environment where all of a sudden their workload's being managed for them. You're putting them right back in the fire. So you're just- And that's what they're them. saying. I got a week's worth of email. Right. We had we had, exactly. we had a guest on earlier this week at Virtual Leader Con that said the yes. companies listen, if you when you leave, you are expected to mm -hmm. and celebrated when you delete all delete all the email. And when you, you come back to email zero and then start again. And that would change a lot for lots of people. We don't have time to unpack that because you've got three more causes by my count <laughs> that you still need to talk about. Yes. So then there's yeah, the three already. And then there's um, lack of agents or lack of fairness. So that's where the discrimination piece comes in, um, you know, making sure that we are things like so we these are big macro problems when we're looking at you know gender equality and pay equality. Some, you know, folks at the World Health Organization are saying it's going to, you know, to fix the pay gap, it's going to take till 2292 or something ridiculous like that. I mean, that is a big thing that needs to be solved already. But we inside of our organizations can be auditing and making sure that there's, you know, equality across the line. We also should be looking at things like maternity and paternity leaves. You know, Hewlett Packard does a really good job and there's others too, like IBM and others that really do this flattening. You know, if it's a, if it's time off for family planning, each person, no matter of their gender, gets the equal amount of time off and they can choose it as they want to. But then it just doesn't place the responsibility on the female to make the choices around family planning if they want to share that with their spouse. I mean, that kind of changes the dynamic. And we need to be you know, thinking like that in those ways that you can actually make changes in your organization through these simple policies um, and they can reduce you know, gender inequality and some of these other you know, issues around systemic discrimination. We need to make sure that our diversity inclusion is actually getting, you know, those strategies are getting at the root of the problem and not just, you know, band-aid at the at sort of as a, a way to take care of it when it's too late. I love that. I think there's one more we haven't talked about. Maybe there's two, but I know there's one for sure. We haven't really talked about the values mismatch. I yes, really, so really there's two more. That. One of them is values and skills mismatch. So you have the values mismatch. And one of the things that we've seen this year across the board is that because people are so overwhelmed, their sensory, you know, and their sort of uh, mental sensory is so deprived right now that we're feeling completely stimulated. We're in back to back meetings. Uh, teachers, for example, teachers, for example, I love that you just did that, Kevin, you're amazing. Um, the, they've been finding that, that 
that the thing that they loved about their job, like the thing that gave them inspiration or where they were connected to is being lost kind of, you know, with the meetings and the emails and the always on and the, you know, that virtual relationship, like teachers aren't connecting to the students. It's better now that they're back in school in many places, but we're also seeing just in general people going, you know, I don't feel effective. You know, what's my value? I'm not connected to the mission of my job anymore. And it's because they're burned out. There's, there's another, there's another psychological phenomenon that goes on. And that is when our, our perspective is impacted by our surroundings. So if my surroundings is, uh, is the North end of my dining room table or the end of my bed or an office in my house, whatever it is, it's, uh, that's what I see. Uh, and the longer that happens, the shorter my view comes and the more insular my view becomes. I'm not walking into the building and seeing the name on the front of the building. I'm not seeing other people. I'm not seeing people wearing a jacket that's got the name of the company on it. I'm not seeing met metrics on monitors in hallways. And so it's harder for me, literally, to be connected to that meaning and that purpose and that bigger idea. So as leaders, we've got to keep people mindful and reminding all of that super, super important. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying, because when we look at just, you know, Gallup's data around friends at work, one friend at work can reduce burnout by 41 percent. And it and we're we're atrophying. I mean, we're by nature as humans, part of our survival is to be part of a tribe. And the fact that we are missing that sense of having a tribe, which a lot of us would get at work. We spend 50 percent of our waking hours at work. So, you know, we're, you have to imagine that those people there are meaningful to us. And, uh, you know, I keep saying that hybrid as is great as long as you have people in the office at the same time and out of this office at the same time. If it's fully remote, spend the money that now that you don't have to pay on commercial real estate, spend it on getting people together in the office at least once a quarter, spend money on a t you know, a, getting your team to actually be with each other. And then if you're in the office full time, understand that people also get exhausted by that. So making sure that there is opportunity for flexibility for those folks too. Like I think getting to that point where we have swung the pendulum really far in one direction and we sort of the goal should be putting it back in the middle not where it was before because you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube but somewhere in in that middle zone and i think that's where people will feel you know in in a state of of healthiness because as a workplace expert i've long been advocating for flexibility somewhere where we meet in that sweet spot and i think that's what we intentionally need to get to the comment that what well, you don't know, and of course, many, anyone who <laughs> might, might be listening to this, if this actually because of pop, becomes a podcast and we don't redo it to make it better, um, is uh, that there's as a leader we have to be focused on both outcomes and others, right? And we've got to make sure that we got the combination of both of those things, and 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 we can get there with the with flexibility if we'll open our eyes and think about it. William is asking you a question that says there used to be a say. Um, uh, no, he asked a question earlier. What happens? It's scrolling away from me. Um, he said, what happens when an employee stands up for their boundaries and says, this is not okay? Well, you know, I think we're a long way away from people feeling completely destigmatized in the workplace, which is unfortunate. But I do think there's some silver linings that did come out of this last year where mental health conversations at work are becoming much more open. We're seeing, you know, leaders in high positions coming out and saying, I've been impacted or this is what's happened with my mental health. And even just senior executives inside of organizations saying, this is an exhausting year for me because collectively we've gone through it. Um, but there's still a ton of stigma inside of organizations. There's a culture where we're not supposed to talk about these things. And that's where I talk about burnout solutions as being a we problem to solve, an ecosystem where organizations and leadership need to be highly involved in this. And then we are, um, you know, we get to a point where we can create some trust where it's not complete learned helplessness and we think there's no change or there's no, you know, there's, it's not entirely cynical where we can't do anything about it. We have a role to play. We can develop our resiliency and our, and our psychological fitness, but organizations need to make it safe for us to be able to do that. It has to be on all sides. We're never going to fix burnout if it isn't a shared approach. The organization, the individual, and the leader that sits in the middle of that, it's all of us. It belongs to all of us. I love, love, love that word ecosystem in this context uh, so very much. Um, so, 
You talked about the causes, and we've talked as we walk through the causes. I don't think we did we talk about lack of recognition and reward yet. No, that's a that's another big cause one. number six, everybody. Yes, cause number six, rewards and recognitions. Rewards, um, you know, we think about rewards in a certain way, like the perks or the compensation piece of it. And we should have table stakes hygiene inside of our organizations. And I, I reflect on often on Herzberg's theory of motivation and hygiene, which is this idea of just sort of basic things that we need to make sure we cover. And that is just pay people properly for the time that they work. That's important. We don't even notice it if it's, if it's, um, if it's there, if it's neutral, we feel it when it's gone. So that's really important, but it's really about how we recognize and reward people in our organizations. Are we rewarding the same looking people every single time we, re we reward or recognize them? You know, are we actually advancing people in an equitable way? Uh, you know, are we using, uh, like compensation as the reason to recognize and reward someone as a way to beef up, you know, their salary every year, we're just recognizing these same people, not understanding that there's a variety of ways. And also that we need to be able to think as human centered leaders, what might as, a, and this is a direct manager responsibility, what this person over here, what they think is um, valuable to them. I don't know what's valuable, valuable to them unless I actively listen. It's golden rule 2.0. Don't do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Do unto others as they would have done unto themselves. And that's really listening, figuring out what's meaningful, taking time to learn what matters to them, and then recognizing them in that nuanced way. And direct managers have a lot of cap capability to do that because in their teams, they can handle those kind of very specific ways of recognizing people um, and showing them that they have value. And don't, leaders, don't just blame this on senior leadership. We need senior leadership. There's a, there's a role for the organization. There's a role that's yours that you can own. And Jennifer's telling you how to do it. Please do it. Carrie calls it the platinum rule. You call it the golden rule 2.0. Call it whatever you want to call it. The point is the same. It's exactly right. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to step back and, and, and ask you, a question about why is it that you ended up doing this kind of work? Well, tell, just tell us very quickly about the journey that led you to this place. You know, I, I studied journalism and I was always a, a researcher by nature, but it was when I, you know, had a personal experience that made me see how certain people develop the skills of post-traumatic growth. And some people, you know, don't get identified as high performing really early on, like athletes or, you know, like high performing um, scholars, they kind of get identified really early on and they get all of this training, psychological fitness training. And so in these times of stress, they rebound in a different way. And so that led me to start up a company with my spouse at the time. And we started up plasticity labs based on the concept of neuroplasticity. We wanted to go into organizations and see like, does it work like a brain? The more that we, you know, neurally wire the impact of well-being and make it sort of part of the assimilated, you know, structure like a brain and those patterns actually changed organizations. And then we would measure it against, you know, NPS, EMPS, sales, all those types of important CFO you know, metrics that matter. But what I came to realize is that we were in a place with people taking them from sort of good to great and optimizing them, motivating. We were in the Herzberg's motivation space. And I came to understand that a lot of organizations are not addressing the hygiene, the mental health piece. People were sick. They don't, you know, you can't necessarily tell them that it's about gratitude, empathy, mindfulness, you know, uh, breathing and yoga. Those things are great if you are at that place ready for them. But my mission became, how do I deal with the, the mo this huge amount of people that are not ready for that and get them to that place where then they are able to accept some of that other part of the process to be well and, and most, you know, well inside of these organizations. Don't offer me ice cream when what I need is water right now, right? Like, uh, I got exactly. to have the water. I'm not ready for something else. I need something else first. Sorry, that's just yes. what came to my mind, maybe. No, I, I love that you said that, Kevin, because actually, Herzberg's theory, um, he was mentored by Maslow. And so when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of, hierarchy of needs, inside an organization, it's the same thing. We need those basic needs met before we can have any, any kind of fulfillment. And so that's my goal is to say, okay, where are we not meeting basic needs? Because if we don't meet basic needs, it's catastrophic and that's burnout. 
right? So we need to get those things met. And then we can start looking at some of those other downstream impacts, which are really great. Like they're great. I'm not saying don't have that anymore inside your organization. That just can't be the only thing we're using in our wellness strategies. We have three more minutes of Jennifer's time because she has a hard stop. So I have two last questions. Question number one, uh, we all need that hygiene. We all need uh, to, the self-care. We said it was more than self-care, but what do you do, Jennifer, what do you do for fun? <laughs> I, so I'm a nerd. I read all the time. I read fiction. I don't even read my own, you know, nonfiction books. What's, read, what's the fiction book? There's my other question. What's the, what are you reading right now? So right now I'm reading A Little Life and it is a really hard novel. I had to actually stop and read a, like a really light book in the middle of it because by 405 page 450, I was like sobbing. So I took a break and went back to it, but it's a, just a beautiful, you know, book, a little life, but I do read constantly. I have, a, I probably read a book every couple of days. Jennifer, I know that having been where you are in the week before your book comes out. So first of all, congratulations and thank you for being here. And I know that in this week, things are so busy and so exciting and all of that. And I'm hoping that we can reconnect and we can do a better job of having a real podcast. Are you up for doing that? Oh, I'd love to. I love talking to you, Kevin. You have great energy. It's always All fun. Right. So we're going to, we're going to, so everybody that's watching, there'll be a, there'll be a sequel. There'll be a, whatever that's, we want to call that for all of you that are. So Jennifer, if you need to go, go ahead and go. We love you. The people in the chat are telling you that right now. Um, great, great success next week with this book. Y'all, I have the ARC. I have the advanced reader copy. You do. You're going to want a copy of this book. So just go put it on your list right now. I'm just telling you that right now. <laughs> and um, we'll connect, Jennifer. And um, for those of you that are didn't know what all this has been, go to virtualleadercon.com and come join us. And all the rest of you know that, virtualleadercon.com. It's free. The rest of the day and all day tomorrow for free. If you like this, you're going to continue to love it. And... Uh, if you know that already, you know where we're going to be. It's time for a break. We're going to see you all at, at 4.15, quarter after the hour, wherever you live. Jennifer, we'll Thank see you, you soon. So Good much. luck next week. Thank you. Five more days. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye.